Hello, everyone. We're excited to be here at ONES September 2020. My name is Renu Nable, and I'm VP and GM of the Edge Computing and Ecosystem Enabling Division at Intel. With me, I have Prakash Kartha, who is the Director of Edge Services Segment at Intel. Together, we're going to be presenting to you how we're bringing in real-time optimizations to edge deployments. Now, the whole industry is shifting massively towards edge computing. The reasons for this are multifold. There's an explosion of data across different types of devices and different types of you know, locations. There is the rise of artificial intelligence and analytics, as well as the advent of 5G. All of this is propelling the industry massively towards edge computing. And some of the underlying drivers are low latency, high bandwidth, end-to-end -end security, as well as seamless and frictionless connectivity. Almost every business or enterprise or industry is looking at how they can take advantage of edge computing to derive you know, actionable insights from the data so they can then impact their own business or, or uh, attribute value to their own business. Intel is looking at edge computing from two different directions. On from one direction, we're looking at how to continue to extend our cloudification and network transformation of the net, uh, network transformation efforts that we've been at since 2011. At the same time, we're also looking at it from the IoT side, where we're looking at how single function in embedded devices are getting transformed to be multi-function intelligent edge platforms. Both of these efforts are together complementing and creating robust edge platforms that can address a variety of different use cases, both on the on-premise edge, as well as the network or the telco edge. As we look at what the Intel strategy is for edge computing, it's threefold. Intel has a diverse portfolio of silicon, um, CPUs, accelerators, um, ethernet, storage. So all of this diverse portfolio has been optimized specifically for edge computing. In addition to that, we have a robust set of developer tools, developer tools that are driving the convergence of analytics and inferencing media capabilities or media optimizations, as well as a variety of networking workloads with some very vertical industry-specific offerings. Some of these tools are called OpenVINO for AI deep learning inferencing, OpenNAS, which is being used for networking and 5G capabilities, Open Visual Cloud for media enhancements, and DPDK for data plane acceleration. And on the third uh, pillar of our strategy is ecosystem scale. We work with over 1,200 ecosystem partners and over 15,000 end users in order to drive scale of these deployments. And we use a variety of different initiatives, such as the market-ready solutions, the RFP-ready kits, the Intel Network Builders Program, as well as the Intel Select Solutions. I will now hand off to Prakash, who will dive deeper into some of these very specific optimizations that we are doing for the edge. So Prakash. Thanks, Renu. Uh, great to be here. So uh, the topic for the day is really around how to enable different types of locations on the edge with cloud native capabilities. So whether you are on the, uh, the access edge or the near edge or the on-premise edge, um, our belief is that you need a common set of building blocks to have a uniform view of the architecture when it comes to different edge locations. So there are three things that are very critical to understand before we get deeper into the topic. Number one is to have a scalable platform, to have a uh, architecture that works on all of these different edge locations, you need a cloud-like environment. And that's why cloud native has become so critical uh, for the edge. 
you need a very modular approach too, because once you start to put these different building blocks together, you can piece these things together in different ways to serve specific use cases for these different edge locations. Um, and you can, you can drive all kinds of synergies between software investments that you're making, uh, between uh, the, the cloud native capabilities. And you do that by putting together these common sets of building blocks uh, coming out of a common technology pool. And if you have these common sense of building blocks, then you can enable the ecosystem in a very uniform way. So uh, there are three things we wanna talk about. Um, one is you kind of start at the bottom of this pyramid that you see here in terms of having a cloud native architectural foundation. We talked about it being uh, scalable, modular, flexible, so that's the foundation. Once you have that, depending on the workload that you're trying to enable, um, whether it's a, uh, a base station, a 5G base station, or a core network, uh, you can start to implement certain KPIs. And the kind of KPIs that we're looking at in all of these locations would be things like high throughput, very low latency, and high determinism. So to get these kinds of KPIs across these different edge locations, you need these consistent, scalable cloud native platforms underneath that. And once you have that, then you can start to enable all kinds of services innovation on top of it, starting with convergence of workloads. You start out with enabling your core workload, whether it be a networking workload, uh, whether it's a 5G base station or a, 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 um, a DPAC inspection or a, uh, a user plane function. Um, but then you also start to integrate other non-networking workloads because that's where the future is going. And to enable that cloud, na that cloud native workload converged kind of environment, you also need open APIs because once you have those open APIs, then you can accelerate your application development. So a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is how all these concepts gonna kind of come together into uh, building blocks put together in the form of blueprints. So now let's dive a little bit deeper into one particular example. In this case, we're gonna talk about the VRAN, the virtualized RAN and how uh, all these different cloud native building blocks, all the concepts that we talked about so far, come together to enable a cloud native VRAN platform. In this example, we're gonna talk about FlexRAN and FlexRAN is the, um, is the, is the containerized um, layer one for a 5G base station. And we'll talk about how FlexRAN layered on top of the openness framework, which provides the cloud native ingredients, builds together, brings together the full platform. So let's talk through some examples. The first one we'll talk about is the container network interfaces, the CNIs. So FlexRAN requires multiple CNIs. So the first thing you would need to consider is Multis. So Multis CNI enables you to attach multiple network interfaces to, you, to your pod. So typically in Kubernetes, each pod has just one network interface. With Multis, you can create a multi-homed pod which is multiple network interfaces. That's the first thing to consider. The default CNI that we have in this particular configuration is Calico, uh, but there's more to it. So for example, the next question that comes up is how do you connect your containers to your NIC interfaces? So SRIOE, for example, the SRIOE CNI is used when you want containers to get access to virtual functions on your NIC ports that are SRIOE enabled, meaning, uh, those NICs that, are, uh, that have both physical functions and virtual functions. And you're able to treat each, uh, fun each uh, virtual function as a separate network interface and you can configure its own uh, uh, Mac, uh, VLAN IP and so on. Now that's one option. The alternate is if you want a, a simpler plugin, uh, you would use something like a host device CNI, um, which will essentially move the, the requested device from the host um, network namespace to the container's network namespace. Um, again, you would use this if you do not have any complicated configuration that mentioned earlier. You can use a, a more simplified CNI like the host CNI, host device CNI. 
The next example of another CNI you would use is the user space CNI. Now the user space CNI is designed to implement user space networking as opposed to kernel space networking. So an example of that would be DPDK, you know, something like OES DPDK with containers. So that's an example. So uh, another one would be the bond CNI. So bonding is, uh, you know, basically provides a method to aggregate multiple network interfaces into a single logical bonded interface. So for that, you would use a bond CNI. There's another one called tuning CNI, a, a very utilitarian CNI that would you use for um, that you would use for changing certain system controls, uh, interface attributes in a network namespace and so on. So ultimately what we're talking about here is a multi CNI type interface and you pick different CNIs based on the particular aspect that you're that, that trying to accentuate. So the next element of the architecture are the, what are the system parts that you would need to have. Um, Node feature discovery is a uh, Kubernetes plugin that you can use uh, to uh, uh, detect and add, you know, basically detect and advertise hardware um, and software capabilities on a platform. So it can be discovered and it facilitates intelligence scheduling. Again, a very useful microservice to have within your, um, uh, within your VRAN cloud native architecture. The next one is core pinning. Uh, a core pinning is a, uh, again, a Kubernetes plugin that provides core affinity for applications deployed as Kubernetes pods. Now let's take a look at some of the uh, the platform parts. So an interesting um, okay, microservice that we we add into this particular configuration is something called RMD or Resource Management Daemon. So RMD is based on Intel's Resource Director technology. What it does is it provides a framework for monitoring and allocating cache and memory. So in the VRAN context, RDT aids. Uh, detection of uh, quote unquote noise neighbors, which helps to reduce performance interference. That's one example. Another example is uh, you need specialized hardware like FPGAs for managing certain uh, parts of your VRAN pipeline, like the forwarder or correction. So we provide a Kubernetes operator that manages the software update, the automation of the FPGA, which can get quite complex without, without this infrastructure. And finally, in an ORAN type context, um, we have a dynamic device profile or a DDP um, for the uh, SmartNICs that Intel offers, which basically run filters for different types of ORAN profiles like the ORAN front hall. So you can see how all of these different building blocks become essential uh, for you to consider as you build the overall platform. Now, as we move forward, uh, let's talk about, uh, let's do a little bit of a double click and, and think through what are those specific real-time optimizations that we've enabled through OpenNest for, uh, for FlexRAN and for VRAN. So we're gonna double click a little bit further. So first let's talk about uh, deterministic IO. So you're talking about deterministic IO on the front hall to achieve ultra low latency and high performance. So OpenNIST provides a number of optimizations to achieve this, including op uh, optimizations in DPDK, uh, offloads to NICs, kernel level optimizations for SRIOE. So overall with these optimizations, we are able to achieve less than 20 microseconds max latency on the front hall. And we've tested this on an extended, uh, over an extended period with various conditions like noisy neighbors, a mix of you know, real time and non real time traffic. And this 20 microseconds is the max. So the average is closer to the min, um, but that's the max we've, uh, we've encountered. Uh, the next element is um, a deterministic acceleration. So, um, you know, similarly, openness provides a highly optimized implementation of 4G and 5G FEC. We talked about this in the previous slide. So uh, these are through optimizations in DPDK. We have flexible APIs to execute in either hardware or software in the FPGA or in an EASIC. Um, look aside models for hardware arbitration with optimizations for configuring uplink downlink ratios, configuring number of queues, and so on and so forth. So a lot of good optimizations around just running forward error correction um, on that FPGA or an EASIC. 
The next element is cloud native orchestration and how to do that in a deterministic fashion. We spoke about this a little bit uh, on the previous slide, but just kind of couple, you know, uh, pick out a couple more points. So NUMA awareness. So NUMA awareness is something that you achieve with a module called topology manager. Now, topology manager is a part of, you know, it's an upstream to Kubernetes, but it's a very important component that you would need to have in your architecture. What the topology manager does is that it maximizes the performance by ensuring that the workload, in this case, FlexRAN, is placed on the socket in such a way that it removes the need for cross UPI communication. What that means is UPI stands for ultra path interconnect. So it's interconnect that connects to CPUs. So if you have new malware nodes and you're able to actually land your, um, your, your workload, in this case, FlexRAN, on, on, on certain sockets that minimizes that you know, cross UPI communication. Again, it's all about determinism and latency. We talked about core pinning, you know, support for hyper-threading, allocating CPU resources to parts, and then we also talked about uh, node feature discovery as another important part. And finally, after all these software optimizations, you still need a very deterministic overall platform. So foundational to this is going to be implementing real-time and real-time preemption in, in Linux. So uh, this is work that Intel has enabled with, with our operating system partners for several years. And now we're making this available uh, with Kubernetes as part of the openness experience kit. Um, what this enables you to do uh, in addition to the real-time is also uh, enable that core isolation, allowing a user to deploy a deterministic workload like FlexRAN, like the RAN DU, for example, on an isolated core and then operate without any interference from other kernel threads. Um, and even if you have a context, which let's say from, you know, context to a higher priority kernel thread, then you are able to switch back to the real time thread in a very deterministic manner. So that's the key point. So it's not that you cannot context switch. When you come back, you do that in a very deterministic manner. And there are optimizations specifically for that. Uh, similarly, we have optimizations for BIOS, um, uh, on, on this on this configuration again uh, an example of that would be from a determinism standpoint is uh, there are certain extensions certain advanced kernel instructions uh, like avx 512 that is required for flex ran uh, which may take higher power right um, and that that may cause certain fluctuations in frequencies which may impact determinism so we have implemented optimizations to minimize um, those 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 uh, the, those fluctuations, and then finally power management, uh, putting cores to lower frequencies, idle you know lower idle states with power states and so on. So you know collectively what we're saying here is a lot of these you know pointed optimizations are coming together in the form of this um, this recipe that we've built in openness that makes it kind of easy for you to go deploy. Um, deploy the, the far edge or the access edge. So now let's talk a little bit about another use case. So now let's talk about the near edge. So near edge is the next level of aggregation uh, from the far edge. So what's obviously uh, the big difference with the near edge is what is the workload running on it, right? So now we are talking about the 5G UPF, you're talking about deep packet inspection, network analytics, but also we have um, AI, you have media, all of these different use cases are now starting to converge. So what we have done is, if you think about the uh, the platform that you that we talked about for RAN, the exact same platform with, different, with a slightly different set of ingredients, we are enabling that for the near edge. You start, so we start with a solid foundation, right? The solid foundation is our hardware ecosystem. So through the Intel Select program, we have, for example, what's known as the NFVI forwarding plane, which is an Intel Select solution for the near edge, which has the right skew of um, CPU, of uh, Ethernet, NICS, Quick Assist, um, even the ability um, to take that Intel Select and start to add on, you know, different types of you know accelerators like AI cards. Um, so you start with that as a baseline, and then what you do is you add on top of that the the, the high throughput data plane, right? So you see the whole DPDK family, you know, OVS DPDK. Um, so that becomes the, 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 the data plane on top of that. Then you layer on top the openness distribution that we just talked about, tweak for the near edge use cases. And then finally, you bring in reference implementations for the network functions, the, the edge services. Uh, what we've done is we put all this stuff together 
into essentially a blueprint. And what we and, and, and as we move forward, we'll show you how this blueprint is not just for the for the near edge, but also for other locations. So now let's talk about how this one blueprint um, is, is kind of expanded to different edge locations. So we talked about the near edge, which is more of a 5G UPF, but uh, this architecture is something that we've been investing in for almost 18 months now, something we call the converged edge reference architecture. The idea that you can take an architectural blueprint and bring together workloads from different starting points and networking workload and inferencing and vision and media workload all coming together into a common architecture, what we call the converged edge reference architecture or SETA. So we in fact launched this um, in 2019 with the first instantiation for 4G in an on-premise uh, type environment which included a, uh, a private wireless recipe for outdoor ruggedized type uh, deployments. What we're doing now is we're taking the same concept and we are starting to build out SERAs or converged edge reference architectures for different network edge locations. The first one that'll be releasing later uh, in September uh, is going to be for the near edge. So we'll have a converged edge reference architecture that we make available through the openness distribution for the near edge. And then we're also working to upgrade the on-premise edge uh, uh, SETA with support for 5G. So you can see how we've taken the idea of, you know, a cloud native platform, building out a blueprint, and then scaling it out into different edge locations. Um, so the, the, the end game for all the stuff is that um, the the SETA is kind of the starting point from a design perspective. It's an architecture. And SETA is based on um, openness as the underlying cloud native platform. Now for us, it's all about the ecosystem at the end of the day, because the ecosystem has to be able to um, take these reference architectures and be able to uh, scale that into, the, into, into actual deployments. So we have, uh, uh, an excellent set of scale programs at Intel. One of the scale programs is called the Intel RFP Ready Kits program. What the Intel RFP Ready Kits program is, is you, you have the ability to work with commercial partners to construct um, essentially <laughs> so kits that can be read, that are ready to be deployed at customer RFPs. So um, what we're doing now is we're taking these uh, SERAs, these converged edge reference architectures, and then converting them into RFP ready kits. We already have RFP ready kits for the 4G on-prem SERAs that we built earlier. So those are already available as part of the catalog that you can get access to. Um, and then for the new SERAs that we're building, we're gonna convert those also into Intel RFP ready kits but we don't stop there. So once an RFP ready kit is available, the next step is to actually get them deployed in commercial instances. So that's when that RFP ready kit becomes what we call a market ready solution. The market ready solution is another scale program focused more on deployment. So once you have a number of these RFP ready kits deployed in the market, then you can start to get scale. That's when system integrators come in and take these market ready solutions and then you have this rinse and repeat. You, you, you get the same solution deployed with different types of use cases at different customers at different enterprises and telcos. So you can see how we've taken the idea of a cloud native platform converted into a reference architecture and scaled into the market. Okay, so that, that was our presentation. Hope, hopefully you enjoyed it. We, um, uh, we, are, we are really um, looking forward to having more and more, uh, you know, investments in cloud native architecture, specifically uh, for the telco edge with, uh, with uh, the access and power edge going into the near edge and continuing to make investments in optimizing it, converting them into reference architectures like the SERA program we talked about and scaling it into the ecosystem. Thank you very much and uh, uh, have a good day.
All right, Precaution Renee, thank you so much. We have you on. Um, feel free to answer any questions now that are in the Q&A panel. We have about five minutes left. You are live whenever you're ready. So, Prakash, I think uh, we have one question here, which is, um, are there any good resources to learn more about the um, real-time optimizations to edge deployments? Um, I think uh, on our website, which is openness.org, um, you, you should find uh, a number of resources, um, white papers and other documents that also talk uh, more about the real-time optimizations. Prakash, anything you want to add? Uh, no, that's good, Renu. Um, so if you go to openness.org, um, just look for a specific white paper on RAM, um, and you'll see a pretty detailed um, playbook and all the different things we talked about are documented there. Yeah, and these uh, uh, these optimizations are included in the um, public version of OpenNest, so you, uh, that is the open source version, so you should be able to get it from the open source version. Uh, I think there's another question on do you plan to include NSVI acceleration in any kit, OBS or uh, VR? I believe we do. Prakash, do you want to take that? Uh... Yeah, yeah. So, um, so for OVS, uh, we have two versions of the, the OVS and the, the OVS DPDK. Uh, both are supported as uh, CNIs through a project called Cube Oven. And so, again, if you go to openness.org, just do a search for Cube Oven, Cube OVN, and you'll see uh, a specific CNI that we've integrated. To, to uh, you know, if you want to implement OVS or OVS DPDK uh, in your cloud native environment, that's the recipe that you can use. Uh, There's another question on um, have any components of Sera been deployed in telcos already? Yes, so we have. Um, so like like we talked about earlier, there are uh, deployments today for the 4G um, on-premise version of Sera. Uh, we have deployments in a uh, uh, in, in more of an enterprise context, uh, this includes a private wireless deployment in an industrial context as well as a retail context. Um, we are moving now into the near edge, so you'll start to see more near edge type deployments in the future. All right. Uh, we have a couple more minutes. Are there any more questions or anything else from the audience? All right. Well, if not, precaution with you. Thank you so much for your time. This is great. Um, we'll go ahead and end it a minute early. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us uh, here. Oh, you bet. Thank you. Thank you.